Well, welcome. My name is uh, uh, Bob Zellman. I teach philosophy, psychology, and religion here. I've been here, I don't know, more than 15 years. I don't know. It gets a little fuzzy after a while. But uh, I'm a part of the continuing series of having brilliant people at, well, I won't include myself in there, but really, really smart people who teach are coming and talking about some things that they know. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about something that I know a little bit of something about and was lucky enough to be a part of in my youth, in my education. So I'm going to be talking about metaphors. So does anyone have any questions? <laughs> does anyone have any answers? Because that's, that's the trick, to come to answers. You know, asking questions is easy, but coming to answers is uh, an important thing. So I teach philosophy, and one of the things that's important about philosophy, and just going to school, is that you learn some of the reasons why we do things. The world is much more beautiful and complex and uh, interesting than your ideas you have in your head of it, right? I, that's one of the first things I want you to appreciate. And so this is something that when I first heard this, it, it just literally changed my worldview. I was like, wow, I started hearing metaphors, something that just meant something to me in poetry class in high school. But it became much more than that because Lakoff and Johnson say something much more profound uh, about that. So um, I'll get started. I can get the clicker going. Here we go. Watch your language, metaphor by uh, Lakoff and Johnson. Human thought is metaphorical. And metaphors are more than just poetry and language. They set the parameters on how you think and what you think is real and true. We live in and think through them. So this isn't just poetry. It isn't just word choice. This lecture is about the conceptual use of metaphors to ask you to become conscious of them and to do better with them. To break up language concepts by becoming aware of how they work and act. Individual words make a difference, but the larger influence and the, the clouds of influence that metaphors create of conceptual structures really make a difference. Metaphors that are just much more than language. They're the structures of meaning that set the table, did you get the metaphor, uh, for reality, perceptions, all kinds of things. They are the structures of meaning that set the table for reality, for perceptions, all kinds of things. Abstract thoughts are almost completely metaphorical. I don't know if you knew that, but this is what Lakoff and, and Johnson argued and, and discovered. So this is worth looking into to become aware of and realize what we mean and to look out for what we mean with others. So my plea, let's wake up and use better metaphors by becoming more aware of how our concepts and thus our pictures and communication about reality are limited at times by their use. I want you to stop using unconsciously, stop using war metaphors, machine metaphors. I want you to use more natural metaphors. This is going to shift our consciousness in a direction that's more fair, um, more communicative, and more working together as a group. Stop with the war machine metaphors. Use biological and organic and, and or, uh, natural metaphors. So today I'm going to be speaking on a topic of language and metaphor invented by a professor I was lucky enough to have as a teacher while getting my PhD at SIU. Most of this stuff is from that book, and uh, so it's not original, but uh, this, is, this is like Elvin Johnson, Mark Johnson here. Wow, what a great teacher. Just sometimes in life you come across people and you're like, thank you, sir, thank you, sir. Just amazing. So this is really important stuff. My goal today is to get you to think about and appreciate your your own metaphorical language and concepts, to become aware of them and their systematic nature. Again, it's more than just language and individual words. It sets the table. We're usually unaware of how much of our language game, but its impact is profound on us. Our conceptions of ourselves, what is real, and our communication and connections to others. Since we largely connect to others via language, it's important to understand what is happening below the deck, so to speak. <laughs> because there are people studying this and quietly picking their language to run political agendas, working to massage and influence your thoughts, beliefs, self-concept, sense of reality. These are politicians, preachers, marketers, and other folks. So, so knowledge is power in this. Since our concepts are captured in language, um, language influences and structures what we perceive, highlight, and we highlight some things over others. It's important to become aware of that and the power and the power to define and our, our, to grasp our everyday sense of reality, of what's brought forward and what's kept behind in some of the metaphors that we choose and use. 
metaphors are often systematic, they're persuasive and influential. And I'm using the, this idea that they're clouds. Clouds, you walk into this. When somebody uses a metaphor, you walk into that sphere of influence of how you heard that and what you take up and what you think is relevant and important. They exist an, an influence beyond their uh, immediate meaning. This is, again, just poetry. That's why it's so important to at least be aware of them and their character. Metaphors structure our thoughts and acts. So let's go to definitions. Philosophers are really big on, people often miss talk. Let's, how many views of God are there in here? Let's argue about God. Well, there's how many people in here? 100 people in here? 50 people? There's 50 views of God. You have to define things right up front. So we're going to do that a bit here. Metaphors structure our ideas and thoughts and acts. Okay. Concept. Here's, what's a concept? A concept is defined as an abstract idea. It's understood to be a fundamental building block underlying our principles, thoughts, and beliefs. Most of our ordinary conceptual systems are metaphorical. That's what Johnson and Lakoff said. How you think about abstract things is through metaphors, and the metaphors set the table for how you and what you think is real and true. Second definition. A metaphor to carry over, meta over for carry. A figure of speech in which one thing is likened to another. Different things are uh, spoken of as if they were each other in some sense. It's implied comparison. It's a comparison to make a point or to create an image. And here's some examples. Screaming headlines, right? All the world's a stage. A very famous one, right? A sea of troubles. Right? Those are some metaphors. Language does this in other ways, too. Analogies, similes, symbols. See your English professors for details on how to crack those open. So let's take an, uh, an idea here and see how the table is set. Arguing. Suppose you and I are having a disagreement. What comes across if I say to you, I'm at war with you? How does that feel? Uh, yeah, whoa, all kinds of things happen, right? But what if I say well, we disagree? Do, do you see the cloud of influence you've walked in by the metaphor that you've chosen here? It's profound, and that's sort of what I'm hinting to you today. The difference is startling of how they feel and what they might lead to next. Conflict resolution, violence, distancing, what's hidden and what's brought forth by the words that you choose, by the metaphor. To become mindful of the influence of these word choices that you and others are making is what this is all about. I want you to start hearing metaphors like, wow, why did I capture that or use that? The one who speaks first might railroad a discussion because of the metaphor of choice. I'm asking you to become aware of what someone says and that you might want to alter the direction of it into something more positive, something more connecting, something more helpful, especially in these politically toxic times. An amazing quote by Lakoff and Johnson reveals so much. The one that sets the metaphors and tone in which a dialogue to take place sets, steers the discussion like one steers a train on tracks. So if you walk into a discussion and somebody uses a certain metaphor, you need to be conscious and aware of, most of us aren't, but you need to be conscious and aware of enough, I want to steer this in a different direction. I want to take this in a different direction. I want something more connecting and communicative, right, at some level. Hmm. Look at arguments of, of war. For most people, arguing is seen as negative, often hostile, may involve personal attacks. I asked my classmate, uh, class of uh, students the other day, I said, how many of you think arguing is a bad thing? And they're like, they all raise their hand, because they come from families, and arguing is something to avoid. But arguing philosophy is, it's not egoistic, it's not about power. But actually in philosophy, you attack the argument, not the person. And a good argument in philosophy doesn't involve egos or struggles for power. But the goal is to mutually know something more, often geared to solving a problem. Language metaphors surround and contain and limit those discussions unless you're aware of how you choose and who sets the table. So let wake up and watch your language, especially of others, advertisers, politicians, preachers, teachers, your parents. So the descriptions of how you couch the concept of an, ar of an argument is found in pools of metaphors that you use. So let's check this out. Look at this, argument says war. His criticisms are right on target. I demolished his argument. See how this is pretty black and white. I demolished his argument. If you use that strategy, I'll wipe you out. Here the argument ends with winning and losing. But there are other ways to look at arguing. Frame, how to frame disagreements. It's possible to look at this as a win-win. We can come to conclusions rather than blows. 
The war metaphor is ubiquitous in our culture. We talk about arguments in this way because we conceive of arguments in that way when we act according to the way we conceive of things. Imagine a culture that conceives of argument as a dance. They use a metaphor of a dance rather than war. Do you see how big this is? This is huge. And we just unconsciously walk into these things and somebody says something, a politician says something, you just adopt that, and now you're in that framework, and now you're on the train, baby. So, you know, get a, get a transfer, right? Go somewhere else, do something different. Shouldn't have done that, but anyway. That was a little weird, that was a little weird. Uh, how, how about this? Imagine a couple, okay. When Pat Benatar sings Love is a Battlefield, I always feel bad for who she might have dated. I mean, <laughs> love can be so many things. Perhaps it's a battlefield, but my God, who did you date? What happened to you? She doesn't know what, what, hell is for children? What, what is going on, Pat? Jeez, Pat, hello. Oh, I feel so bad. Go ahead. Uh, Lakoff and Johnson go further. Because of capitalism, time, time is uh, money. Time is money. I ask this at every one of my classes. They go, well, uh, time is what? And they all go, time is money. And I go, how do you know that? How do you know that? It's just built into us because of capitalism. It's just thick and thin throughout us. So you bleed capitalism. You're, you're wasting my time. He lived on borrowed time. You need to budget your time. I invested a lot of time in her. That flat tire cost me an hour. You don't use your time profitably. Joe is in prison serving time. What is time? Time can be lots of things. But we get locked down by these metaphorical clouds we inhabit. Get creative. Look and listen and learn to do something more creative. Older cultures don't conceive of time in this way. And you don't have to either. But when you're locked in. We, we, this is how we talk about it. It's how we conceive things. Our everyday experiences are structured by this frame of reference, and we're not even aware of it. That's my point today. Wake up. Wake up. Unless you frame yourself, others will frame you. The media, your enemies, your competitors, your well-meaning friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. Watch your language. I wonder how many cooperative opportunities and possibilities are lost via the language games we unconsciously allow to frame our perceptions and realities. Finally, metaphors are useful, and I want to share a particular situation that I'm aware of. My, my wife told me this two weeks ago. That has ch somebody changed the metaphor and thus their experience. Imagine you've been given a diagnosis of life-threatening cancer. One of the common metaphors used is war, to fight it, to battle and win. It's, it's, I hear this is ubiquitous, it's everywhere, I hear it all the time. Very common and at times useful. I guess the cancer wins if you, you know, lose though, right? It's a win-lose. Hmm. But how about this? How about if you describe your cancer as just, it's a part of your journey. You see it differently. It's something to treat, but it's something to think through. It's something to learn from. It's something to resolve to make a part of your, your life, whatever it gives and takes and offers or teaches you. What a different worldview. What a different, I, I think a, a grander, world, more beautiful worldview, rather than I'm just in this you know, life and death battle with this thing and it's black and white. And it's, it's more complicated than that. We frame reality unconsciously by the metaphors we use. And taken or that are taken and given. Recognize that and watch your language to create more meaningful, detailed, and connecting organic and biological metaphors. To create a better society and ways of thinking, we need to watch our language. Go natural and organic, not mechanical and war bound. What you think you become, what you say is what you see. Thoughts, comments? Questions. I'm going to take one second. I want to read you metaphors. Johnson and Lakoff in this book created. I was at school when people sat in rooms and they just came up with creative metaphors for describing things. And some of these are just, I love language and I, I have to read this stuff to you. Ideas are food. I like both. How about that? What he said left a bad taste in my mouth. All his papers are have all his papers have in it are raw facts. I love this stuff half-baked ideas and warmed over theories. There are too many facts here for me to digest. I really can't swallow that claim. That argument smells fishy. <laughs> this is incredible. Mm. Now there's a theory you can really sink your teeth into. We need to let that idea percolate for a while. That's food for thought. Mm. He's a voracious reader. 
Let's let that idea simmer on the back burner for a while. That idea has been fermenting for years. Man, I wish we talked like that. That would be, anyway. So, uh, what else here? Um, ideas are plants. His ideas have finally come to fruition. Uh, that idea died on the vine. That's a budding theory. It will take years for that idea to come to full flow. I'm smiling. I, I love this. It's incredible. Like, why don't I talk like this? Mathematics has many branches. The seeds of his ideas were planted in his youth. She has a fertile imagination. He has a barren mind. I've met a few people like that. But anyway, so uh, this is great stuff. Here's the book by Lakoff and Johnson, uh, printed in 1980. It's actually worth reading. But I put a YouTube video up here that's very well done that uh, pretty much says almost exactly what I said. But Lakoff and Johnson go further. Um, their stuff is very philosophical. They actually talk about orientation, that up is good, and um, spatial meditation, uh, spatial metaphors. Up is good, down is bad. Why? Because of the kind of bodies we have. We talk about in and out, inner feelings versus outer feelings, container kind of metaphors. We do this all the time. And they talk about how profound it is. And we're just not even aware of it. We just use language. We just kind of splash it on things. It's, unless you're an English professor or a poet or something, right? You pay more attention or you're a songwriter. But, uh, and then here's another book. Classical English metaphor. I didn't even know there was a book like this, but this person must be very smart and take their time. They went through and uh, found all kinds of classical metaphors and classical kinds of uh, English language kinds of stuff. Shakespeare and whatever, use them all the time. And it's just fun to add this to your vocabulary so that you can say more, you can say more accurately and connect rather than just be stuck with the, the metaphors that we are often stuck with that people hand us. Again, questions, thoughts, comments? Yes? Yes. Um, I, I'm struck by how often people use metaphors and they don't realize they are metaphors. Because they become, I think a metaphor, if it becomes completely because it becomes cliche. That's interesting. Down interesting. To. But I also have noticed how sometimes we can use metaphors uh, to illustrate. Because I think a, 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 a well-constructed metaphor is a way to illuminate and give you a deeper understanding of something that you were having trouble grasping. Exactly. Because it because it, it makes that implied comparison you're talking about. Exactly. But I also notice how politicians will sometimes um, try to sell ideas or policies uh, or prospective policies using metaphor. <laughs> as if the metaphor itself is the thing, and that's the whole point. And so you know. Seeing, seeing your presentation kind of puts me in mind of that and how uh, something that can be beautiful, uh, uh, well-constructed metaphor that's helpful, can also become uh, dangerous. Yes. Um, as, as soon as we accept the, the aptness of a metaphor, we are more likely to be sold on a policy that might have nothing to do in reality with the metaphor that has been used for it. So I see that a lot in, in the way that politicians talk about it. Um, what they see as the problems in our... I could see in a debate, two people have different views and somebody sets the railroad tracks of like, this is what we're going to talk about and these are the metaphors. And then somebody, you jump on the train, you're going down their road and like, nope, I want to take this from a different angle. It's kind of like therapy to me. Therapy, what's therapy? Therapy is, here's the view you have. Therapy and a therapist gets you out of it and goes, have you ever looked at it from this way? And that's like, oh, I never have. That's very useful and helpful, right? And so this is the same thing. Here's the way we're locked in. How about if we just sort of approach it from a different direction? Oh, that's, that's helpful. It's insightful. I know more now. Maybe I can take this up in a different, more creative way. So, so it could be argued that all language in and of itself is inherently unfortunate by its very nature. I think, I think most of it is. It's just, this is what teaching is. You know what teaching is? Teaching is, um, okay, this is like this, and this is like this, and this is like a wheel, and you oversimplify, but that's it. You know what this is? No, well, this is like, you break things down, and you compare things. That's, that's I, I think you're right. That's what language is. Other continued thoughts, comments, anybody? It really is, yeah. Do you have a favorite metaphor? <laughs> Like, all time. Yes, yes, yes. I just put it up on my class the other day. And I said, ooh, I'm going to put this on the board, but I haven't had time to do it. It's uh, kind of a Buddhist thing. Let's see if I can get this right. Friend, 
feelings are like uh, feelings are visitors. Just let them come and go. Feelings are like visitors. Just let them come and go. Because what do we do? We cling to things. We hold to things. And then we don't realize things are going to change. Okay, I'm happy now. Guess what? You're going to be sad. And then guess what? You're going to be happy. And get, You know, it's a process. It's a coming and a going. Rather than, oh my gosh, I just want to be happy. I want to be on the happy high end of everything. And this is all bad. What, what world do you live in? So, so thank you. That's... Or feelings or visitors, let them come and go. <clears throat> it's about time. Thank you. I appreciate it.